Hello everyone, this is Al Fadi, and uh, I would like to welcome you to another episode of this uh, brand new series that we were doing, myself and Dr. Jay Smith, basically uh, putting it all together in terms of all of the previous shows and the previous uh, basically topics that have been discussed related to the historical criticism of Islam. And of course, I'll be remiss if I don't mention the most common uh, now phrase that is being used, which is the standard Islamic narrative known as SIN. So today, for this at least episode, we are going to focus more on what does that mean and what is it that we need to really be unpacking when it comes to that narrative. Uh, Dr. J, uh, thank you again for being here with us. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what do we mean by the standard Islamic narrative and who really uh, coined uh, something like this, technically speaking? Well, yes, this is the, the term that we're using and we've been using in the last two years. Uh, why two years? Well, two years ago on June 8th, there was that infamous interview that between Muhammad Hijab, who represents the East, versus uh, Yasser, Dr. Yasser Qadi, who represents the West, or in this case, Houston and United States. And in that interview, he turns to Muhammad Hijab and he says, you, referring to you in the East, which are 99% of all Muslims, your standard narrative has holes in it. We grabbed that and, and created it as a meme because standard narrative, what standard nar- narrative? The standard Islamic narrative. It's mm-hmm. not the Christian narrative. It's not the Buddhist or the humanist or the atheist narrative. This is the standard Islamic narrative, he was saying, has holes in it. So that has become a signature piece for Dr. Yasser Qadi. Right. He didn't invent the, the phrase. We took it, those of us who were the sin sifters, we grabbed it and then we started using it. Now it's, beca- it's, be- it's been used all over the world as the standard Islamic narrative. So what is the standard Islamic narrative? These are the traditions. Right. And exactly. these are the four genre of traditions. Uh, they are the Sira, which would be the biography of Muhammad, supposedly written by uh, Ibn Ishaq, but we don't have his material. So Ibn Hisham is the one that we look to right. uh, from 833. Then uh, you have the what they call the sayings of Muhammad, the Hadith, which were first compiled by al-Buhari. We're going to be talking more and unpacking this, giving you a graph to help you understand, uh, with the audience to understand it. So that's the second genre, and there are many others besides al-Buhari that come after him. And then the third genre would be the tafsir. The tafsir would be the, the commentaries to unpack the Quran. That's the third tradition, set of traditions, first introduced by al-Tabari in about 923. And then the fourth genre would be the tahrik, which would be the histories also introduced by al-Tabari uh, in about, well, just before he died in 923. Now, those are what known as the you Islamic traditions. You mean the tarikh, I think you meant. You mean the tarikh, uh, the history? The last tarikh, one. yeah. What yeah. did I say? Tarikh, yeah. Uh, Excuse my pronunciation. No, no, no problem. I just I'm want to American. make sure. Uh, it's, I, I should let you actually do this since you Now, know. when you said tahrik, it, it meant grammar. Uh, I wanted to uh, just make sure people understood what you're trying to say. It's tarik that you're focused tarik. on. Tarik. Yeah. Now, these yeah. four genres, sira, hadith, tafsir, and tarik, are the four, what most academics know as the Islamic traditions. Mm-hmm. We have capsulated the, the, that as a standard Islamic narrative. And we purposely do that because we were, we're trying to we're trying to confront that narrative. It's that narrative that all these episodes are going to be about. Right. And I want to say uh, that narrative that uh, you are going to uh, at least uh, critique right now. Within it, embedded, the book, the man, and the place. Because, yes, because that yeah, narrative is yeah. all. If, if you look. The Sira and the Hadith are all about Muhammad. They're all about what he did, what he said. We have the same thing in Christianity, uh, in the New Testament. The New Testament would be the, the, the parallel to that. We also have the Sira of Jesus. That would be Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The black letter, uh, everything that's written in black, that would be the biography of Jesus. We also have the Hadith of Jesus. In many of your Bibles, in my Bible, I have whenever Jesus speaks, it's written in red letters. So the red letter part of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John would be the Hadith of Jesus. So there's the equivalent. We also have the Tafsir of Jesus, but we don't call it the Tafsir. We call it the commentaries 
by Paul, the letters of Paul. When he was writing to Ephesus, he took what Jesus said and applied it to Ephesus. He took what Jesus said and applied it to Philippi. He took what Jesus said and he applied it to Corinth and he applied it to Rome. And every time he did that, that expounded upon it and gave body to it and showed how it can be lived out. And, and even more than Paul, John also, first, second, third John, Peter, first and second Peter, all of those did accomplish the same thing. So that's called tafsir. Exactly. That's yeah. the tafsir of Jesus, though written by others. Mm -hmm. And then the last genre, the tariq. How do you, how do you say it again? Tariq. Tariq. I have to make sure I say it correctly. I'll, I'll just let you say it so I don't keep embarrassing no myself. Yeah. <laughs> so the tariq. I'm just trying to protect you because you know how they attack you all the time, you know, so that's all. I got thick skin. I'm used to it now. <laughs> so that genre, which you call is yeah. uh, is it, the equivalent would be the book of Acts, uh, written by Luke. So mm -hmm. Acts of the Apostles would be the history of the early church. So there's the four genres which make up the New Testament, the equivalent of these traditions or the equivalent of the standard Islamic narrative, we would call it the standard Christian narrative. So S-C-N, S-C-N, when you look at it, doesn't really say something, but when you say S-I-N, of course, as a phrase, as a word, it's sin. So in some ways, it's a it's a, it's a double entendre. It's a play on words. It's a play know, on words. Yeah. We have a tongue in cheek. We're kind of saying, yeah. let's then confront sin. And so we are confronting sin is what we're doing. And that's what the sin sifters are. We are standard Islamic narrative sifters. We're mm -hmm. sifting sin. And we name ourselves that as tongue in cheek, uh, uh, kind of having a joke about it. But we are doing something very serious. Right. It is that narrative that we're going to be confronting. It is that narrative that pinpoints the man, the book, and the place. It is that narrative that you grew up with. It oh, is exactly. And that's what Yasser Qadi probably meant by your uh, Islam versus our Islam, East and the West. I grew up in the East. Uh, that's the birthplace of Islam, at least from a standard Islamic narrative. Uh, I grew up near Mecca. That's the birthplace of Muhammad and the direction of the Qibla. Uh, I uh, also believed in a book called the Quran that was revealed from 610 until 632, collected or compiled twice, first time by Abu Bakr, second time by uh, Uthman. I mean, this these are part uh, and elements and components of what we call the standard Islamic narrative of the East. Let's put it this way. And ironically speaking, when Yasser Qadi pointed that out to Muhammad Hijab, he was not, he didn't realize that he himself represents that as well. Of course. It's but, kind of interesting when he said East and West. I mean, there is no such thing as one Islam, technically speaking. His West really represents probably 1%, less than 1% of all Muslims. Really what he's saying is academic Islam. The academia here in the West has a different set of criteria, have a different genre, a different milieu that they have to work in. And he was pointing that out to Muhammad Hijab. He didn't realize we were all watching this. Yeah. And I want to give him credit, by the way. He is absolutely correct when it comes to the academic field in the, in the West. You're open to critique in Islam and its sources. You cannot do it in the East. You'll be basically, uh, technically speaking, ostracized and even maybe even thrown in jail and hung if you dare to do something like that. So I can see where he's coming from academically speaking, but you're absolutely correct when it comes to the practice of Islam. Sure, maybe there is one, two percent that may dare to go against this, uh, the uh, mainstream. And did you see the dilemma that came out in that interview? If you look at that interview, he turns towards Muhammad Hijab, says, you your standard narrative has holes in it. He didn't realize, and what he was saying really is, we in the West, we live in a completely different atmosphere. We have to follow in, we have to follow a different criteria. We have to deal with these academics who have no red lines. Mm -hmm. You in the East, you have a red line beyond which you don't go. Certain things you don't ask. He said, we respect the Quran, for instance. He gave that as an example. And we don't ask certain questions of the Quran. Whereas me, going to Yale University, getting a PhD there in 1995, he went through a crisis. Uh, Muhammad Ijaz says, is that where you went through your crisis of faith? And he recoiled. Mm -hmm. says, no, 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 no. This was not a crisis of faith. It was a crisis of knowledge, a crisis of understanding. He had to say that because he did have a crisis of faith. Why? Look what he said next. He then went and says, 
since that time, so we're talking 1995, we were now into 2020, so we're talking 25 years later, and he said, in the last 25 years, I have never spoken about this. I have never talked about the Kirat. I have never talked about this problem, the Ahruf and the Kirat, not publicly. You know why? Because it will trigger that crisis again from a psychological standpoint. So this was a crisis of, of faith. Of course. It wasn't course. just a crisis of knowledge. Yeah. He wanted to uh, cl uh, cloak it in crisis of knowledge. And I'm sitting there and I'm applauding when I say, here we finally have an honest Muslim. Absolutely. We all applauded him for that. Sadly, of course, he recanted immediately under pressure. And what I liked about what he says, you cannot talk about it, but if you take his course, you can take a deep dive. <laughs> <laughs> Which means even even for 25 years you've taken this course, he still hasn't come to conclusion. And he made that very clear. He said, for the last thousand years, nobody has been able to answer this question. This has been the most difficult problem, he said, for the last thousand years. Which is true. Interesting that you mentioned thousand years. Even though Islam has been around, according to the standard Islamic narrative, for 1,400 years, for uh, 1,400 years, the last thousand years have been the a deal breaker for that. Because the first 400 years, really, when you study the early Islamic sources, uh, there were some level of openness, actually, give and take. And there were uh, debates about, uh, you know, Islam and its prophet and its message. But it was the last thousand years that technically turned the table around and it became a monotone only. Well, go. what are we going to talk about next time? We're going to actually look and at the standard Islamic narrative. And what we want to do in the next episode is unpack what are the questions about the Quran that we want to cover? What are the questions about Muhammad that we want to cover? Or early Islam, as we call it, that we want to cover? And what are the questions about Mecca? Why are we delving into just these three areas? That's going to be the next episode. Wonderful. Thank you so much, as always. Thank you, everyone. Uh, hopefully, uh, you are enjoying uh, this uh, series. Uh, feel free to always reach out to me or to Dr. J through his channel or my channel. If you have questions, if you have clarifications, if even you have recommended sources, we're always welcome in that. And we take your comments very seriously. In fact, the whole series that we're doing is because of your comments, because we wanted to make sure we honor your request to put it all together in a way that hopefully will be helpful to you. Thank you again. This is Al Fadi, over and out. God bless. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sira International, and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.